Well, <laughs> there's been a, a lot of, I don't know of a lot of talk, but I guess there's this eclipse. Is that tomorrow? And is there some prophecy about world destruction coming? All right, so for those of you who believe this, we're going to be talking about how to prepare a survival pack for it, okay? How to survive uh, a world cataclysmic event like um, the sun being partially blocked if, or fully blocked, whatever it is, and things like that. But this is serious, okay? What do you put into a backpack like this to survive? I've given a lot of thought, and my one goal is just to feel good. And so this is what I put into my backpack. <laughs> yep, there you go. I mean, some of that stuff I probably, you know, but I mean, the Reese's and the Snickers and things like that, that's right, on, right up my alley. How many would you do, would you do that? You know, that's, that doesn't make much sense unless... I mean, if that's your world perspective, that I'm, I'm about being happy and feeling good, and, and if chocolate does it for you, so be it. But you're not going to survive very long, are you? Seriously, what do you put, put in a backpack? And, and I know it's, you may not be able to read all of this, but this is what they suggest, okay? You need to have up in the top left, you have to have a tourniquet, first aid kit, and a shovel, and a knife, water filter, tent, a uh, wire saw that looks like a pair of handcuffs on the left upper area there. Uh, survival bracelet, I guess that has a little compass on it, huh? What else would it have? Oh, the string comes across, okay. Uh, reflective vest. All right. <laughs> if you're crossing the middle of the highway at night, yes. That would help you survive, I think. Um, a water bag. Yeah, I want to drink a raincoat. Safety pins, I guess. Mosquito net, gloves, a power pack. I guess that's so your phone can be used when the world is destroyed. You'll still be able to text somebody. Uh, a sab All right, what's a saber card? What's that? Multi-purpose tool. Okay, it, it fixes your cars. And st I don't know. Uh, and then a glow stick. A fire starter. You see this flashlight? They call it a torch. What does that tell you? Where's this from? Great Britain. Great Britain. Seriously, a torch. It's a flashlight. Uh, you need that. You need, um, go down here, face mask, pliers, fork. I, I mean, you can go on here. Mini stove, swimming armbands. And I thought about that. How does that help you survive? I suppose if you're going to swim across Lake Michigan or something. I don't know, but this is what's recommended. Uh, mini pot, cup. What's that? <laughs> you want to survive, this is what you need to be put in your backpack, okay? Uh, but seriously, you know, when it talks about surviving, we should be talking about uh, somebody has to carry it, right? And so whenever you have a big backpack, you always got to find some guy like this. Look at this guy. This is from World War I, I think it is. And he's, he's got to be what? 120 years old, it looks like. And he's got these big looks, wheels, and he's carrying these two guys on that thing there. This is what you need to really survive. Who's going to carry all that with you, right? Got to have somebody to carry it because I'm not carrying that backpack. So I'm going to grab this guy here to help me. Which leads us to this, a more serious thing, and that is um, the Christian Survivor Pack. Let's talk about that. Now we'll get serious, okay? What would you put into this here? Figuratively speaking, what do you carry with you in life to be a survivor? But actually, I don't like the word survivor because I don't think God wants us to survive. He wants us to thrive and to be full of life, an abundant life, and to have peace and, and such forth like that. But we'll call it a survivor pack. What would you put into that? Now, don't answer it because you'll be embarrassed because it won't match what I say. But I'd put in companionship, right? You look around today, how many of you would like to be the only one in this room and have me preaching at you? I'd feel very comfortable about it, but you probably wouldn't. You, you, you need companionship. You don't want to go through life alone. You need somebody that, that hooks their arm around you and say, let's walk together. 
here's my hand, let me pull you up, because you're going to pull me up too. You want companionship because you don't want to think you're crazy. You want to think people out there, there's somebody out there that is like you and has the same beliefs that you do. So companionship. The other thing you want to put in there is grace and peace. Now we're going to talk about what these things are in a minute, but just, so you want grace and peace. God's grace, his benevolence towards you, peace with him and peace with other people. You, you need that in life. You don't want to just always be in turmoil inside. And you want faith and love. And, you're, and if you have these five things, there's more things that we could put in, but in the passage we're going to look at today, these are the five that are listed. All right? This is what you want in your pack, but you need somebody to carry it for you. And this is important. Who's going to carry that? You say, well, I will. No, you won't. You need our, your risen Savior to carry it. As he lives within you, he is the presence of all those things. So we're going to go today on this road, this Christian walk. We're going to start the book of Second Thessalonians. If you're old enough to remember, last fall we went through First Thessalonians. And a lot of it was about the end times. And we're going to go into Second Thessalonians. It says we've got to take a pause. And we did this about what, three month thing on Matthew chapter 24 about the end times. And so it kind of helped many of us that are not as familiar with these ideas to therefore get into Second Thessalonians. Because in Second Thessalonians it deals with some more of the finer points of Christ's return. But that wasn't the only thing he, Paul, wanted to talk to these people in Thessalonica. And Thessalonica was a Greek city. It would be in kind of, kind of modern-day Turkey today. Turkey didn't exist back then as a nation. In the, on the Aegean Sea, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, it's, it's, it's out there. Uh, metropolitan, a, Ro a Greek city with Roman values and things like that. An important industrial city, marketing city, and things like that. And Paul had planted a church there with a man named Silas, and we're going to see Silas is mentioned in here. And it, 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 when, you, when you build something up, you really have a heart for it, right? So when Paul had left that city, he was hearing reports about troubles, so he wrote 1 Thessalonians, uh, what we call a letter, 1 Thessalonians to deal with some issues. But then the issues still were there. Many more questions were coming. So he writes another letter to this church. And he addresses the issues of when is Christ returning because they were being taught by some false teachers, you missed the plane or the boat or the train or the stagecoach. It's left without you. Christ has returned and for some reason you're not part of that kingdom now. And that was troubling people's souls. They're also under great persecution uh, and uh, great troubles and things like that. It, there were a lot of Jews in the city who did not like the idea of Christ being the Jewish Messiah and they were persecuting the people. There were pagan religions uh, all over the place and they did not like Christianity telling the people that there's only one true God and these other fault idols that you're worshiping are not real. They're, and they didn't like that. So they're under a lot of persecution. Then he had some lazy people in the church who said, well, if Christ is returning soon, I'm, I don't need to go to work anymore. I'm just going to come to church and we're going to have our potlucks and I'll eat food there. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that. You're, if, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. And so he would, we'll, we'll see that later on at, at, towards the end of this book. But anyway, I want to begin here in verses 1 through 4. And if you have a Bible... If you don't, you're out of luck. Unless you reach into the seat in front of you, then you can turn to page of nine, 989, 989, 2 Thessalonians. And we're going to study this book together. We're going to begin today, and we're going to look at this Christian walk. And in the beginning, this, this greeting that Paul brings to this church, he brings up some... I mean, it's so easy to just kind of read these first four verses and not even... Understand that he just gave us a ton of great things to believe in and trust in if we don't read through them too quickly. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to see number one in verse one that we have this walk with in companionship with one another. We're not alone. We're not alone. God never intended us to be alone. Not only are we with him, we're with one another. Look what he says here in verse one. 
He just begins Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy to the church of Thessalonica and God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's a salutation, right? So let's go on. No, let's, let's stop. Because right here, he is saying something to these people who are struggling with persecution and with false teaching. He's saying, you're not alone. Paul and Silas and Timothy, who are these guys? Well, we know the Apostle Paul. Uh, they knew Paul. Paul is Jewish. Paul was commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to go throughout the uh, Roman world and, 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 and begin planting churches or sharing the gospel and bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ and, and setting up places where they could meet together and have good teaching, correct teaching. Uh, so there's Paul, he's an apostle. And then you have Silas and Timothy, or you might, your Bible might say Sylvanius, it's, it's the same person here. Silas was with Paul, and as what we understand in the book of Acts, Paul went on a number of missionary journeys, and on the second one he went to the city of Thessalonica with Silas, and they started this church. And then there's Timothy, and we know Timothy was, uh, had a Greek father and Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, and his mother and grandmother were instrumental in helping Timothy believe in the God of creation, the God, what we would say, of the Old Testament. And, uh, and they, they were powerfully influential in his life. When Paul met him, Paul brought him to faith in Jesus Christ, and Timothy became his uh, what, protege, his assistant, and was well known also. So these three guys, these three names, are very well known to the people of Thessalonica. And so not all of Paul's letters start this way. I mean, when he wrote to the Church of Rome, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that's it. So, but he includes these two other people here. And there's a reason for that. It's because Paul wanted the people in Thessalonica to know, listen, this isn't just me talking to you. These are two guys you know also. You know Sil uh, Silas. He was with me. He cares about you. In fact, it might have been Silas or Timothy that brought this news back to, to Paul about the troubles they were having. And so Paul is basically writing to them and says, hey guys, we care about you. You're not alone. I know you feel like you're alone. I feel, you feel all this pressure from the outside and you're, you're, you have trials and tribulations within your own heart. You're, you're wondering what's going on here. And, and so he adds these names to them to kind of give him some weight or some uh, uh, help these people understand that you may have some false teachers in there, but we're here to tell you what the truth is. And I'm not saying this alone. Here's a couple guys with me that care about you. Isn't it important to know that people care about you? I'm not, I'm uh, be a little bit vulnerable here, if, if you don't mind, but I know that's not my strength as a pastor. It never has been. I'm not proud of it. I'm not the kind of guy that will call you up and say, hey, I'm coming over for coffee. Open, you know, get it on the stove. I have to be invited. That's just my personality. I'm not, some pastors just are so gracious and able to just step into your life and they'll visit you and they'll hang out with you and they'll do all these kind of things like that and and I think well I wish I had somebody like that with me but that's not who I am but we need people like that you need people that are going to step into your life because they care about you you need people because that, that are watching you that can see hey you don't look like you're doing well today and you're thinking how did you notice I thought I was hiding it because they're just gifted by God and they pay attention to what you, they study you, and, and, and they, 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 their heart goes out to you. And that's what the church is supposed to be like. The church is supposed to be known. Now, we've got, we're small numbers today, but, but still we probably represent the, a broad spectrum of personalities in this room right now. And that's how God made us. Uh, he wants the people that are kind of stoic and kind of go forward with life, and then he wants the people that are just all cheerful and see the good in everything and things like that, and we need all these kind of people here. That's what makes up the body of Christ, and that's what's so cool about it. The point Paul is making here is that, hey, myself, Paul speaking, and Silas and Timothy, we're on your team. But he doesn't stop there. He says uh, to the church, the church uh, is the body of Christ, it's a people who are gathered together. The word church literally means 
called out, those who've been called out, called out of what? This pagan world, this atheistic world, this world that opposes God's rule and comes up with their own kind of idols to worship. He said, I'm calling you out of that world to come into my world and you are going to meet together and you're going to be the body of Christ, the hands, the feet, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the toes of Christ. You are the people of God. Christ is ahead. And when you come together, you're the church. Am I the church alone at home? No. You're part of the church, but the church is when you gather together. When you're together for the purpose of, of being devoted to the apostles' teaching, being devoted to one another in fellowship, to be devoted to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You're gathered together. That's what the church literally means. So he's writing to this church in God. And I mentioned these two people, God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What is interesting about this is Paul, being this very devout Jew, never ever would have put the name of Jesus Christ in the same sentence as God the Father, unless, what? There's some kind of equality there. Do you see this here? This should never be overlooked because Paul was too smart of a Jew to know that you could put them in the same sentence as if they were equal, unless they were equal. So it says, you have God, and, and here's what God likes to be thought about. When, we, when you think of God, he wants you to think about your father. All right, now, I had kind of an absentee father, and my father was an alcoholic. Uh, wasn't there. Divorced my mom, married a woman just a few years older than my older sister. Um, I don't have that really great view of that being a great father. My father loved me, and he did a lot of nice things. We'd go camping together. He taught me how to fish. Not very good, but he, he, he cared about me, but he wasn't there. So I had this kind of mixture of what a father should look like, right? And that's the trouble many of us have here is saying, well, you should see God as your father. And you say, well, if you had a great father, you are on the right path of understanding what this is, and it's a good thing for you. But some of us had, you know, mediocre fathers, and some of you might have had some really not good fathers. What do you do? We have to kind of relearn what a father is. You have to relearn. You have to unlearn things. So much about Christianity is about unlearning, right? So here you have to unlearn about uh, what a father is. And you need to say, and this isn't being disparaging about your earthly father, because none of us are perfect. I certainly was not a perfect father by any means. And I don't need any amens for my children in the room <laughs> at this point. But, uh, you, you know, the Father in heaven, take the very best of your earthly father, then say, this is my heavenly father, but much, much better. So what is a father? He's, he's a, well, when you think of dad, you think about somebody who's got bigger muscles than you is, when you're a kid and can lift you up, throw you in the air and catch you powerful one. When you think about your earthly father, you think about he goes to work every day, leaves it you know, before I go to school. I know it's different today. But some, you know, Moms are often working and they need to work today too. But you know, dads go off to work and then they come back home tired and grumpy, right? Because they worked all day. But you know something? They provided for you. Right? And dads, if they're available, go, and I know moms do this too, but they go to your sports games and they play catch with you, or they don't play dolls with you, but they, you know, maybe they do. I guess that's okay. But, you know, dads are the powerful providers and protectors. I mean, a dad's never going to say, hey, there's somebody in the garage, go check it out, to Junior, right? That's not a father, that's a coward. And he's not going to say that to the, his, his wife either. Mom, you know, honey, you know, I, there's somebody downstairs and, you know, could you check that out for me? I, I got to get up early and go to work in the morning. Do you mind? You know, there's a bat on, behind the door. Grab that with you because you don't know what you might run into. No, they, you don't do that because God made women in his image. He made a male and female. He made them differently. But our Heavenly Father is portrayed here as father, a male figure, because he's strong, he's a giver of life, he provides, he protects. And so God wants you to say, hey, when you think of me, 
I would really appreciate it if you would think of me as a father to you. Now, what? And then you have the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord, he isn't, he's not mentioned as Savior, Jesus Christ. Rarely do you see that as a title to Jesus, you know, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's usually our Lord Jesus Christ, because in the word Jesus Christ is the idea of Savior. Jesus means the Lord saves. That's what the name means. Christ means Messiah or anointed one. And so you have this idea that here's Jesus Christ. He is the one who was anointed to save you, but he does it as Lord or King. And I love to think about it this way here, is my King is the one who died for me. And in the history of kingdoms in this world, it's the people who have to die for the king to protect him. But that's not the way this is. This is our king dies for us. What do I have here? I like this verse out of John 17. He says this, Jesus is praying for you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus is praying for you. And he's prayed this that you would understand that I in them, Jesus in us, and God the Father is in me, Jesus is speaking, so I am in them, the Father's in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the word, world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And I just want you to stop and look at this, that very top sentence there when Jesus is saying, I am in them. His Holy Spirit is in you. And that the, you, the Father, is in me. You think of the companionship there. Think about it for a second. Next time you think of looking at something you shouldn't look at or say something you shouldn't think about, think about that. But also when you're troubled in heart and you're, you're struggling and you're, you think the world is collapsing around you, and, and you think about the fact that uh, those storms are coming, and are you going to be able to, to stand against the storms in life? Well, that's the wrong picture, but we'll get to that in a second here. Yeah, you can stand. But the point here is that you have to stay in fellowship. And that's what this is about here. If you're a log and you want to be burning, where do you have to be? You want to be on the outside? You want to be in the middle. And it doesn't matter. I can take one of those logs from the very middle, pull it on the outside, and what's going to happen to it before long? It's going to burn out. It's not going to burn up, it's going to burn out. Because it's not contained within the fire itself. And that's what happens when people say, I don't need church, I don't need the fellowship, I'm strong, I can do this on my own. They're all a bunch of hypocrites anyway. All they want is my money. They just want to fill the pews up. They just want to do this and this and that. And I'm saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. That's not a healthy thing to say. You need to understand that if you want to be full of abundant life with the presence of God in you here, you have to come to the fellowship and be a part of it. Otherwise, you're going to be a log that just is smoldering and not on fire. Let's go on here because we want to see now this idea that we walk in grace and peace. Remember filling up your survivor pack? We saw companionship. Let's also lock, you know, we've got uh, grace and peace in here. Paul says this here. He says, uh, God, uh, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Two very powerful things that we should just kind of stop and look at for a second. You know, what is grace and what is peace? Uh, And and if we don't really understand that, uh, we're not really going to be able to find the fulfillment of those ideas effectively working in our lives here. Uh, Grace is what you say at the dinner table, right? Say grace. I, I think it's more than that. Grace is, and many of you know this, is, is God's uh, attitude towards us. It's, it's unmerited. It means you don't deserve it. It is uh, complete. It's fulfilling. It's, it's God's power in us. I like to think about it this way here. Uh, you know, grace is uh, giving us what we don't deserve, and you've heard this before, and mercy is withholding what we do deserve. So mer- you deserve to be punished, but mercy is going to say, I will not punish you. You don't deserve to be loved, but I'm going to give you that love anyway. So grace is something that we wear so much within our hearts. Here, here's a good way for me to understand grace 
is if uh, I was driving down the road here and some body comes around me very quick and runs me off the road and almost crashes me into a tree and they're laughing as I do that, I get my car back on the road, go down the road and I see he went out of control and crashed his car. Grace is this here, I stop and I help him. Even if he needs mouth to mouth. Even with those words that he, you know, he was laughing at me as he drove me off the road. Now I'm ready to put my mouth on his mouth and breathe life into him. Because he deserved it. No, because that's what grace is. See, we, um, how do, there's just really no easy way, but we're just terrible sinners. Okay? I mean, it's one thing if I look around at you and say, hey, I'm not that bad. <laughs> you, know? you can look at me and say, I'm not that bad either. It's, it's so human for us to just look at one another and say, hey, I'm not like that person. I'm not like this person. Look at this good I've done here. And God's saying, it's all filthy rags to me. If we stood before the holiness of God, one of the most powerful images of that is in Revelation chapter 1. John was probably the closest of all the apostles to Jesus. He knew him intimately. And yet in, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he's in, uh, he, he was in jailed in the island of Patmos and he was being persecuted. He had this vision and there was a resurrected Christ standing before him. And what did John do? He didn't run and throw his arms around. Here's, hey Jesus, good to see you again. But he fell down like a dead man because he, he encountered the purity and the holiness of his Savior. And we don't fall down as dead people enough before God. And until we do, we don't really understand the grace of God. And this isn't meant to make you feel guilty and ashamed because you've sinned, but it's to try to help you understand that you'll never appreciate the love of God until you understand how much you don't deserve the love of God. And then you have peace. Peace is a wellness inside. It's, it's the idea of, of being uh, having contentment with where you're at and being assured that you are safe. Peace is, is found, you know, we can have peace in nations, between nations, you can have peace between individuals. But here he's talking about the peace that you can have between you and God. And the reason you have peace bef between you and God, the hostility between God, or the reason for hostilities has been removed. There's no reason for God to hold you as a hostile, as an enemy of his. There is no reason, and that's what communion was for, to remind us that God has no cause to be angry with you as a person, as his child. Yes, we can sin, and he will discipline us as a father does. I'm not saying that. But the cause of our hostility towards God has been removed because our guilt has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. It's been removed, so now when Jesus looks at you, he sees you through what Jesus has done, and we have that assurance of peace. But what's interesting here is we have grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus. Again, you cannot put Jesus and God the Father together unless you have both divine nature, understand they're both divine. But the other thing is peace and grace always come from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We may try to find it in this world, and we do. That's why we are people uh, that we have this consumer mentality to get today or this entertainment mentality today growing in the world is people need to be entertained or consume things and possess things because they don't really have peace within them and they hope I can have peace if I have this thing or if I do this thing, at least I can be laughing at life and don't have to take things serious. But what God is telling us here is real Peace that lasts forever comes only from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And what does this peace look like to you? This is what it looks like to me. It's not that the storms are gone, right? But that I'm encased in a place in my life where these waves cannot hit me internally. And peace is in the middle of your, in the inner soul of your life. Sometimes God removes the storms to us and it's a blessing when he does. And we should pray for that, God. If it's your will, can you take this storm out of my life? God says, sometimes yes, sometimes I'm going to do something better. I'm going to encase you in my love. I'm going to keep you here safe, that you're going to learn that as big as this wave is, I am bigger still. And that I can get you through this, and you will get through this. And that's real peace. Now then, Paul talks about walking with faith and love. In verses 3 and 4, 
Well, let's take a look at it here. He says, we ought always to give thanks. We, we all ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of all you have for one another is increasing. And, and this is in part due to the trials and tribulations that they were having. Trials and tribulations are one of the, I hate to say gifts of God, but it's one of the instruments of God that draws us to, to understand the love that we have for one another. Because when you're in the tri difficult trials, you look around saying, what is it that I can hold on to? And then you see, I, I read this statement the other day, um, you really know what you value in life. Or if you want to know what you value in life, you look around and you'll notice the things you treasure most are those things that money cannot buy and death cannot take away from you. What does that leave? It's, it's got to be people, relationships, because you can't buy people and you can't buy relationships and death can't take you away from those things. Temporarily separate you, but... So he says, we thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. They're brothers and sisters, and as you are with one another in this room, and that your faith is growing. What is faith? Well, here it is. Faith, Paul, or not Paul, the writer of Hebrews says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In other words, the, the, you know, my faith is not blind, ignorant, and committing intellectual suicide, kind of speaking. My faith is based upon clear evidence that there is a God, that there is a creator. All I have to do is be willing to acknowledge it and believe it and accept it. He's out there. I can sit there and give every other reason for the reason this world is here, but the truth is it's here because there's design and the evidence that there's a creator here. We do not see him, but we're certain of it. Faith comes from hearing the word of God because even an atheist has faith. They have faith in something. But what do you have faith in? If you want to have faith that is true, it has to be based upon the word of God. So Paul was thankful for this faith that they had and that their love uh, for one another was increasing more and more. As, they, as you get to know people, you get to know the fact that you see the image of God in them and you start to value the fact that, yeah, they're different from you, but that's how God made them. And when you recognize, I'm not perfect, I can have great, show grace to other people who are imperfect, and when we start to do that and start to love people and be forgiving and show grace to one another, our faith in God has increased and our love for one another increases. And if that's what happens, then we're able, as Paul said, for your, he was thankful for their perseverance and faith in the midst of their persecutions and afflictions. So he's talking about persecutions and afflictions that they need to persevere and endure in, and they do it because of their faith. And if you don't have faith, you are going to be, you're going to succumb, you're going to drown, you're going to fall, you're, going to, you're not going to survive and endure the afflictions of life. Unless you drink a lot. Or smoke. Or do something, or get engaged in something in this world uh, as some kind of placebo out there that'll kind of heal you there a little bit. But Paul says, there's a better one. This is trust God. And the rest of this letter tells them what's coming. And we're going to see what they are to have faith in. This is um, our church. I took this picture this morning. I'm quite proud of myself because I learned how to get it from my camera into the computer with the help of somebody else in church. What, what do we want to be known for? Because Paul says here, he says, um, verse 4, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfast for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Wouldn't it be a wonderful testimony if this is what Liberty Community Church was known for? That we are known for our increasing faith, increasing love for one another, that we have people who know how to endure uh, trials and afflictions and persecutions uh, because they're part of this community. They're not alone. They're, they're, they've got brothers and sisters who care for them. They have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and they have faith, and know they can shed tears and, and cry out at times because of the pain of life. They don't give up. Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony of Liberty Community Church and, and other churches in this area too? 
would they be known for that too? Well, let's pray for that for us. Doesn't mean we're perfect. I, I'm sure Paul, uh, I mean, we know that the, the church in Thessalonica wasn't perfect because Paul had to write them a letter and say, you got some things wrong. You got some lazy people in there. And he wrote to churches in, uh, in Corinth about the immorality that was going on in there. And he had to write their church in Ephesus about broken marriages and things like that, men who weren't loving their wives and such. So the churches weren't perfect, but Paul could still be thankful because they have the truth and they were growing in the truth. And that's all that God wants from us is to grow in faith. Father, thank you so much for this love that you've given us. And we hope and pray, Father, that we would continue to, to depend upon the Spirit of Christ that indwells us that we would continue to read your scriptures and grow in your scriptures and apply these truths to our lives. And I pray for the grace and peace that you've promised us, that we would show grace and peace to one another, forgiving one another, encouraging one another, and letting one another know that they're not alone in all their trials. Uh, thank you for your love, Father, and thank you for the love of one another that we have for each other. In Jesus' name, amen.